and not a doer, he shall be compared to a man beholding his own countenance in a glass. For he beheld himself and went his way, and presently forgot what manner of man he was. But he that hath looked into the perfect law of liberty, and hath continued therein, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And if any man think himself to be religious, not bridling his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Religion clean and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their tribulation, and to keep oneself unspotted from this world. And then the Gospel. And then we're in St. John chapter 16. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say unto you, If you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in Proverbs. The hour cometh when I will no more speak to you in Proverbs, but will show you plainly of the Father. In that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not to you that I will ask the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. And because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God, I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples say to him, Behold, now thou speakest plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we know that thou knowest all things, and that thou needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Thus for the words of today's Holy Gospel. And the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. We are in this last few days of these 40 days of Christ after the resurrection. As St. Saint Augustine says, he was very busy during this period. He was visiting his disciples, visiting his apostles, and was very, very busy preparing them for the next stage of battle. And the next stage of battle is 2,000 years. And remember that before he left, when he, when he saw when he saw St. Mary Magdalene on Easter Sunday, he did tell her, No le me tangere. You cannot touch me now, for you will not touch me until hereafter. So that I'm going to go to the Father, and you will not be able to touch me hereafter. But then also our Lord himself is very busy during this time. But what is he doing? He's preparing his apostles for battle. And what was it like during this time? Consider the heart of the apostles. Consider the spirit of those, uh, those uh, that were following Christ. Remember, 3,000 would be baptized on Easter, on Pentecost Sunday in a few days. And then 2,000 would be baptized the next day. Now at this time of the great rejoicing of Easter Sunday, until Ascension Thursday, there were only a few hundred souls. <clears throat> a few hundred souls. And then at the end, several thousand will see him. Three or four thousand will see him on the day of ascension as he ascends up into heaven. Well, several thousand souls, a few thousand souls in the entire world are going to see Christ. A few hundred of them see him. And what, what environment are they seeing him in? Consider the double emotions that are inside of the apostles. On the one side, and the holy women and of the, the early uh, disciples, the 72 disciples, what's in their heart during these 40 days? Consider one thing. Our Lord Jesus Christ was just crucified 40 days ago. He was just crucified on Good Friday. And then 40 days after Easter, he will rise from the dead. So he was just crucified about a month, less than only a few more days than a month ago. And, and, then, and then he was put to death. And then he rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples. And there was a double movement going on. On the one side, the word of the victory of the resurrection was spreading throughout the world. It would not have its greatest power until 50 days after that resurrection, when the Holy Ghost would come and descend with great authority and great power and majesty upon those apostles of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then they would baptize and send the church on its world, on its world to tour to bring Christ and that victory of the resurrection and the victory of the cross to the whole world. We're in that in-between period in which it is essentially Easter Sunday was only a few days ago. Pentecost has not yet come. 
and there is a double movement inside of the heart. On the one side, they are so happy. They are so filled with an indescribable joy because Jesus Christ, who was dead, has come to life again, that he was gone from them, is now with them, that he has conquered death itself, that he has defeated the Romans who tried to kill him, he defeated the Jews who tried to kill him, he defeated all of the, 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 the people around the, of the whole earth, all the sinners tried to bring about his death, and he did truly die. But then he conquered that death. And so on the one side, they're very happy because there's been a conquering of death. For the first time in the history of the world, a man rose by his own power and he defeated death. And they are his followers. And so there's a great confidence and there's a great rejoicing in one side of their hearts. But what's happening at the same time? They still have minds. They still know the world that's around them. This is a world that only a few days ago said, let him be crucified. This is a world that said, let his blood be an apostle upon us, upon our children. A world that said, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. A world that watched him die on the cross while they were casting lots before his body. Before they were watching him die, they were casting lots about his clothing. A world of those that went home, uh, striking their breasts for five minutes, but then forgetting quickly about it. And this world did not know God. This world did not love God. This world did not serve God. And in fact, this world hated God. And there was only a few of them. And the world is very large. And so on the one side, they are very, very happy and very, very at peace inside of their hearts because Christ is risen and we have him. But he's appearing to us here and then he disappears and he appears again and he disappears. He comes and he goes. And one day he will come in a few days on this Ascension Thursday, a few days from now. And then he is going to appear before several thousand of them. And then he is going to ascend into heaven. So they are rejoicing in one side of their heart because they know they have the Christ that conquered death. But on the other side, he told us to go out and preach to this world. He told us to go out and bring Christ to this world. This world is not ready to receive him. This world hates him. The government hates him. The laws of the world are against him. And we are only fishermen. We are, are, we are only fishermen. And we are not only fishermen, but even amongst the Jews, we are despised because we are Galileans. So even amongst our own people, we're despised. And amongst the whole world, we are despised. And we are supposed to carry this Jesus Christ out to the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ did say, I will make you fishers of men. You're going to go out and conquer the Romans. You're going to go out and conquer the Greeks. You're going to go out and conquer all the world for Christ. And they have mixed emotions inside of them. They are in a great and great joy on the one side and worried and disturbed on the other. These things are inside of them. And this happens many times in our lives. We know, for instance, in this present crisis, the so-called non-coronavirus thing, and also in the present crisis of the church since Vatican II, and in the general crisis, which is the chastisement that has come upon the world, we know that the Blessed Virgin Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ have already conquered death. Remember those words that Christ said to his apostles, but he said it on Holy Thursday night, and he said it before he died, and he said it before he was buried in the tomb, and so on. He said, Confidite, Ego vici mundum. Have confidence because I have already conquered the world. And Satan is defeated. And they heard these words and they were confident. But then Christ died and they forgot about that confidence. They're like Jonas when he was thrown back upon the shore. Jonas tried to run away from God. But then he was captured by the whale. He was swallowed in the belly of the whale and brought right back to where after three days he was brought right back where he came from and thrown upon the shore. And there he is. Now when Jonas arises and realizes he's alive, not only does he realize that he is alive, he's not going to die in that whale, but he's back where he came from. One side of his heart is encouraged because he's back where he came from. God took him back, but he doesn't know what to do. But God told him what to do. Before he ran away, God told him, Jonas, go and preach to the Ninevites. You go and preach to them, and you tell them that they are sinners, and because their sins have cried to God, they're going to be put to death. So he knew what to say, 
but he was afraid. Therefore, God appeared to Jonas a second time. And this is that time in which the Lord Jesus Christ appears to his apostles a second time. He already told them during the three and a half years what they must do. He gave them all the instructions. He spent all the time with them. And remember on Holy Thursday night, he had manifested how frustrated that he was because Philip said to our Lord Jesus Christ, show us the Father. And he said, Philip, how long do I have to be with you? Do you not know whoever sees me sees the Father? How long have you been, you've been with me the last three and a half years? I've told you these things so many times. How long must I be with you? And then our Lord died only a few hours later. He left, but what does he do? He comes back, and he comes back, and he comes back. We must understand that when the apostles, even though they were told, here is my teaching, I've taught you well. You have seen my victory, and you see my victory well. Now go out and do your duty, just like Jonas. Jonas already told you what to do. You tried to run away. You even woke up in that middle of the storm. You were sleeping in the storm. And you woke up in the storm and said, I am the cause of this storm. And then you were cast in the sea. And the wise priest and the wise bishop of our age must recognize that we are the cause of the storm. Why is there a great crisis right now? Why is there fear of the loss of all freedoms? Why is there fear of the loss of all jobs? Why is there an economic crisis? Why is there a crisis of closing the doors of the churches? Why is there a crisis of the whole collapse of Western civilization? This crisis is because the priests have been the cause of the crisis. They have been sleeping in a boat during the middle of a storm when they were supposed to be fighting against the waves of heresy and fighting against the waves of sin and the wind of heresy. They were supposed to be fighting against those things, but they have not done it, and hence there is a crisis. And then also Our Lady of Quito said also that the time of this age is going to be a crisis of the priesthood because the priests will not know where they're going. And so likewise, what about today? Now the average idiot doesn't know where he's going. How should he? When the captain of the ship doesn't know where he's going. When the pilot doesn't know where he's going. How on earth can, this, can those that are in the ship or those that are in the plane know where they're going? And so the crisis that we're in right now is a grave crisis of priesthood. It is a crisis of priests, and the priests know the answer. And not only the priests, but also the Catholics in general. Not just priests, priests primarily, but Catholics in general. We already know the answer. But here we must understand about these days between, Ascension, between Easter and Ascension Thursday. Our Lord Jesus Christ should not have to appear to us so many times. Our God should not have to appear to Jonas. Recognize the spot where you got vomited back upon the shore. Remember what I told you to do? Go and do it. But the Lord appeared to Jonas a second time and he reminded him. So likewise, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to speak to his apostles after 40 days of appearing to them over and over again. Going therefore, Teach ye all nations whatsoever things I have taught you. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Teach them all things that I have taught you. And I will be with you even unto the consummation of the world. The same one that told St. Mary Magdalene, No, you can't be with me. Not until heaven. The same Jesus Christ said, I will be with you under the consummation of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ is never too far away. Here we are reminded that yes, there are two facts, two parts of their emotions in the spiritual life. One of them is called desolation. The other is called consolation. And desolation seems the biggest to us and seems the most common to us. That we must persevere at the time of difficulty, persevere at the time of desolation. Consider the great desolation of Abraham. When God told Abraham, go and slay your only son Isaac. And Abraham, being a man of great faith, the greatest of faith, he did not argue with God. And he walked with his only son Isaac. And all the sorrow of that journey. But he was not going to change his duty. He was not going to change his, his, his life. His life, the life of Abraham, was a life of following God. In every circumstance, and obeying God in every situation. 
including the time of difficulty. But what happened when Abraham picked up his knife in order to slay his only son Isaac? Then the angel of the Lord appeared, and God appeared and said, Hold back thy hand. And there was another sacrifice instead. And here we see, as has happened so many times in history, Jacob was absolutely terrified, and Jacob ran away from Esau. And Jacob, though he had received the birthright, and though he and also if he received the birthright, what should he understand? I just got the birthright, and the promise that was given to my grandfather Abraham, passed on to my father Isaac, is now passed to me, and I will have more children than there are stars in the heavens. And yet. One of the conditions of having children is you got to be alive. Another condition is you got to have a wife. I don't have a wife yet. And I have a brother that wants to kill me. Esau wants to kill me, and I'm running away from the only home I know. And I'm going alone in the wilderness. And he was terrified. And he was exhausted in spirit. Did he need an apparition? Did he need to see the vision of the angels going up and down on the ladder of Jacob? Did he need to see that in the place called Bethel? No, he did not. But what happened? In his sorrow, God appeared to him. In his sorrow, God gave him a dream. And we must understand that we must experience sorrows. We must experience desolations. But never if we love God, never if we are faithful, will desolations be the only thing. Never, never, never. Our Lord told St. Teresa she must suffer much, and she did. But then she had visions, and she climbed, elevated in the sky and saw the seventh heaven. And all the saints would suffer much. But what did they did suffer much? But what did they happen? They had such greater joys and such greater visitations of Christ during their tribulations than others have in all of their lives, in all the joys of their lives. We must understand as we enter into a time of crisis, because we are now ready to enter into a new time of crisis. We really are. And when we enter into this time of crisis, if we know God, if we love God, if we serve God, if we speak to him in our hearts, there'll be times of tears. But these times will not be continuous. Our Lord will continue to come back and continue to come back. What happened to St. Peter only a few days after the resurrection. I am an apostle. I'm supposed to go out and preach. But I remember I used to be a fisherman. Let's go fishing. We haven't gone fishing for a long time. Let's go fishing. And five went with him. Five included himself. Five of those apostles got on a boat. And they went fishing like old times. They had forgotten about Christ. Even though they were apostles. Even though he rose from the dead, they still didn't know what to do. So they went fishing. And what happened? Christ came to them on the shore. He let them catch 153 fish. He cooked them a dinner. He fed them the fish. And he gave, finally, the power of the keys to St. Peter. He had already given the power of the keys before, but he gives it again. So remember this about the apparitions of our Lord. God told Jonas what to do. But then he reminds him. One of the mysteries of our lives as Catholics and as human beings, as, as, as human beings, we're not like the angels. The angels are told something once, and they decide to do, and they do. And they never change their minds. So if an angel says, I follow God, he'll never change his mind. And if a devil says, I follow Satan, he'll never change his mind. But human beings are not that way. And that's the negative side. The negative side is that we can always change our minds. Today I follow Christ. Who knows what tomorrow brings? Today I follow the devil. Who knows what tomorrow brings? Maybe tomorrow we'll change and become saints. Like St. Augustine did. Augustine said, Oh Lord, make me a saint, make me a saint, make me a saint. But not yet. And then finally one day he became a saint. And so Augustine was an enemy of God, but became his friend. Judas was a friend of God, but then he became his enemy. Now, it's true that we can change. That's one side. We are the friends of God. May tomorrow be his enemies. Therefore, let us work on our, our salvation in fear and trembling. Those who are enemies of God, we should not hate too much. Because tomorrow they might be his friends. And therefore, be not too, late, too hateful to those that are the enemies. Be not too confident in those that are the friends. 
But that's the negative side, that we are fickle and we can change. But there's another side too. God made us human beings that he doesn't just tell us things once. He doesn't just tell us things once. All the girls are supposed to know this in their marriages. All the marriage, every day, the husband and wife must say to each other, I love you, I love you, I love you. They have to say it every day. It's interesting, as the years go by, it becomes harder to do that. But it must be every day. It must be repeated and repeated and repeated. God made us as an animals, rational animals. As rational, reason is truth only once. But as animals, you ate breakfast last month. Why do you want breakfast this month? As animals, we must eat breakfast last month and this month, yesterday and today. As rational, the truth never changes. God made us rational animals. And the two are intimately connected together. And hence, it is not enough for us to believe the truth one day. We must repeat it. And our Lord Jesus Christ recognizes that. And therefore, he comes down, and he comes down, and he comes down. He will never, ever abandon us. He'll never, ever not come down again and not come down again. He will always come down again. Even as we're traveling the struggles of life and the difficulties of our persevering in the faith, and it seems so challenging and so discouraging sometimes, Christ will always give an encouragement. He'll always give a consolation. He'll always give a little bit of peace. He says, I'm going to make you work and work and work, but then he will give you a peace and peace and peace. This is the way it is with the saints. Because God made us human beings. He made us human beings. And he knows that we need repetition. Not only does our, our body need repetition, it must eat every day, it must sleep every day, and so on. So likewise, because we are human minds. We're not angelic minds, we're human minds. And hence God willed that every single year that he dies on Good Friday, and every single year he rises on Easter Sunday, and we are reminded of it again and again, and every Mass, he is crucified again and again. He conquers Satan again and again. And, he, and, he is, and therefore, this God, who is never going to abandon us, he's going to visit us again and again. We are in a struggle. We're in a fight. We're in a time of challenges. But Christ is busy visiting again and again. And he began to teach the apostles during these 40 days. He was with them physically every minute during the three and a half years that came before. When the apostles in the upper room are confused, the apostles in the room don't know what to do. I don't understand. It makes sense. St. John seems to believe John is a really smart man. And he really believed Jesus rose, that this, this might be for real, that Jesus really rose from the dead. And St. Peter said he saw John, saw Christ also. And they were both there at the tomb. Peter saw Christ. John said he, he, saw, he understood. The women said they saw. But I don't know. Is this really real? I'm not sure, even though I should believe, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And what happened? The Lord Jesus Christ came through the doors. He came through the doors. He stood in the midst of them and he said, Peace be to you, pax vobis. Now remember this, when we know and love God, we will have times of confusion, even though we should not be confused. Jonas knew what to do. We will have times of confusion, even though there's no excuse for it. And Christ will pass through locked doors, and he will say, Pax Vobis, peace be to you. Here is the answer. You should have believed St. John when he saw that and explained to you how the tomb was empty. You should have believed St. Peter when he showed you that I spoke with him this very morning. And then also you should have believed Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was not, was not one to give in to, to believe things lightly, and she truly saw me. And yet you're still questioning. That's all right. He appears in the doors. But then Thomas was missing. And what happened? He appears in the doors again eight days later, just for the sake of Thomas. Now, if our Lord will make a special trip just for Thomas, because he was missing when the other apostles were present that one time, and he made one special trip after another, visiting St. Peter, when even though he loved God, he was beginning to get distracted by fishing, he was distracted by swords earlier in the garden, and now he's distracted by fishing. And our Lord Jesus Christ comes and tells him, Look, how do you catch fish, Peter? You only catch fish because of me. And then St. Peter jumped out of the boat and swam to the shore, and so must rejoice to be with his Lord. And he would still have struggles. And remember this, as we experience the struggles of life, look to God. St. Bernard talks about it also when he says, Look at the Holy Mother. She's the most perfect of them all. And our Lord left her for three days. For three days. That's an infinite amount of time when you have the love that she had. The more the love is, 
The, the, each minute is a longer period of time away from the beloved. And no one can have the love of the Blessed Virgin Mary for her son. No one can have the love of St. Joseph also. And for three days they sought him sorrowing. And when their agony was so complete that it could be unbearable even for the Blessed Virgin Mary, unbearable even for St. Joseph, in their absolute perfection, they found Christ and they were consoled in his presence. And then he went and grew and waxed strong in their presence before God and men. Every time our Lord Jesus Christ lets us suffer, know that a visit is around the corner. He's going to come and visit. He's not going to leave us abandoned. He'll come and visit. He'll come and visit. He'll come and visit. St. Peter once wanted to baptize someone in the side of the cell in the Mamertine prison. But there was no water, and the water appeared. Daniel was, was starving and hungry inside the lion's den. But what happened? The Habakkuk came and brought him food. Peter was not sure how long he would be in prison. And the doors opened, and he thought he had a dream. And he walked out because it was not his time to die. And so it is and that God will make sure that his will is accomplished, and he will visit, and he will visit, and he will visit. So let us not be too, too discouraged about the dark times that are ahead of us. There are dark times ahead. The persecution of the church has really begun in a visible way. But each time we have Mass, we now have a greater uncertitude as to when the next Mass will be and whether we'll be able to have one again. And yet God will never ever leave us abandoned. He'll make sure that there's going to be a reception of His grace, a reception of all the things that we need, and He will see us, and He will see us, and He will see us. He will appear at the most strange times, but always when we need Him, including when there are locked doors, including when it's impossible for Him to be found. He will come, He will come, He will come. Behold, I am with you all days, even with the consummation of the world. Therefore, let us make our prayers. We have the rogation days coming up, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And when during these rogation days, we say, let's sing the litany of the saints. It's good to read the litany of the saints. And we ask for God to give us this day our daily physical bread. We are reminded that the only reason we have food is because of God. And the only reason we have shelter is because of God. And therefore, we must always ask God for our daily bread. As we say in the Our Father. And we are reminded of that during the course of these last three days before Christ goes up in heaven. All things come from Him. But we'll also ask, not only for our daily bread, but that our Lord visit us, and He visit us, and He visit us, even in our times of tribulations and trials. He appeared to the saints in prison. He appeared to, He, he allowed Jonas to find Him from the depths of the ocean in the bottom of the sea. And yet he, Jonas found Christ. And Jonas received his strength. And Jonas not only was a prophet that found Christ, but our Lord Jesus Christ compared himself personally to Jonas. None were separated in sorrow as far as Jonas was, and none of the victory of Jonas. And don't forget what our Lord did say to his twelve apostles. You will do greater things than I have done. Our Lord Jesus Christ preached sermons and they repented for five minutes. But when St. Bernard preached a sermon, when St. Anthony preached a sermon, they repented and died saints. He performed many miracles, so many miracles. But when you put all the miracles of the saints all together, they performed more miracles than Christ performed upon the earth. St. Gregory the Wonder Worker physically moved a mountain. Our Lord never did when he walked this earth. And there will be a great, you will do greater things than I have done. And why does our Lord do this? To show his power. Because of this, the, master, the servant is not greater than the master, and yet the master will allow the servant to do greater things. Mm -hmm. And this will happen until the very ending of the world. So in any case, just persevere in our, in our faith and have confidence in the time of trouble that God will provide, because he will provide, and he will visit and visit again all the days of our troubles until the day we meet him on the day of our death. Hosea, God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.